Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about values in Go and then we're going to seem to talk about something that doesn't seem to be related to Go but actually related to pretty much all computers. But having this basic idea and understanding how things are represented in computers, we're going to talk a little bit about bits and numbers. But we're not going to go too deep like if we were a um, computer engineer or electrical engineer, but as a computer scientist or a programmer, it's good to have some idea of what's going on when you type something into a computer and how it's actually stored or represented. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We can get back into how um, different types of values or data is represented when we talk about um, data types, but we're going to kind of start that conversation at the end of, towards the end of this video. In Go, you can type values for a number of different types uh, of data types. Um, so um, I'm just showing you some here. So you can type in bytes, you can type in integers, strings, booleans, arrays, map. And um, in this chapter, we're going to cover some of that and a little bit about data type in general, but we're not going to get too much into it. And we talk a little bit about how things are stored. But you're going to see there are other data types in Go that aren't listed here, like structs, for example, and interfaces are all typed in Go, but we're not going to really talk about it. We're going to talk about sort of the, what you want to think of the basic data types. And the basic data types actually don't include the, the um, maps, but arrays is kind of included too. Um, but don't worry, this is kind of the objective is to play with some of these types, get an idea of what they are, and then start to look a little bit deeper at what's going on. I said we're going to start talking about values. So what is a value? So this is my definition. A value is an abstraction to represent a computed result. That's a value. Um, so you do any kind of computation, at the end of it, you're going to end up with a value. Um, but not all values are computed. Some values just represent themselves. And when we have a value that stands for itself, we just call it a literal. And um, note, a literal is still a value. It's just that in this way case where um, you get to that value, not by big computation, but when it stands for itself. So here's an example. So the number six is itself. You don't have to compute that. You don't have to say three plus three or five plus one to get the value six. So six is a literal. Um, but three plus one, those two literals, when computed, give you the value four. All right? um, same thing that the value of pi here, 3.1415, whatever. Um, that's also, we can say that's a literal. It just stands for itself. Similarly, the string, veril, is a string literal. You didn't have to compute it by saying VR, the string, plus ROL, another string, or any number of other ways that you could compute the same value. So here we have a value that's a literal, and then we can have values that are computed. Um, similarly, Go supports um, has, uh, as a basic type, tr Boolean values, which are just true and false. And true there is a keyword. It is not a variable or something that represents something else. Is is itself, you know, the value true, and there is also the keyword false, which again stands for itself false. So let's look at a simple example here of printing out some values. And so you know the structure of a Go program, so I'm not going to go over the things you already know. So let's start from line six down to seventeen. So in line six, we've seen this statement before, right? Use the format package and call the method print line and it's going to print out something and terminate it with a new line that's what the ln is for for new line and so it's going to print hello world followed by a new line and that's going to allow us to again print something on another line because when we say print six it's going to print it on that new line um, and then again go to a new line so um, we can go through a program and we could see that though you can see that FMT allows you to print all different types of values. So the first line there is printing a string, the next one is printing a number, and then of course I could print more than one value at a time. So then I could print a string, comma, a number. And I don't have to put spaces there um, in my string because as we will see in the output, um, the FMT package take care of once you present it with multiple values, it writes out the result and values and then um, put the space. So if we look at the output when we run this program, you can see the value of six colon space six, even though when I just put the string and I ended the string immediately after the colon, I'm now seeing a space after the colon. And you can see all those values that they are printed out, right? And you could go back between um, the code and the output and try to look at it and um, match up what was written and what gets printed out. And I encourage you to do that. 
So definitely um, check out the code on GitHub and that's going to be in the description below and do that or just kind of pause the video and just go back and forth between those two slides here. Thing that you may not realize, even though we seem to have printed out a bunch of different type of values there, you know, we printed out um, Boolean through um, false, we print out complex numbers and strings and all these different things. But one thing you may not realize that in a computer, any computer, everything you type into a computer is a character. Everything you press a key, that's a character. And every character, character is represented by a number inside of the computer. So all the computer is doing is manipulating numbers. And a number is built up by bits. So what is a bit? Well, let's look at it. So if numbers are built up by bits, what exactly is a bit? So a bit is like a switch in that it's either on or off. There's no in-between state, right? And so you call it a binary value or a binary system because binary means two, right? Like bicycle, so, um, so just two value. So you can think of when the switch is off, the value of that bit is zero. And when the switch is on, the value of that bit is one. And so that's what's being represented here. When the light is on, you can say the bit has the value one. So when we had a single bit, we were able to represent two distinct states, which was the state of the light being off or zero and the state of the light being on, which was one. But then if we use more than one bit, and more than one bit would be the equivalent of here having two light bulbs. So you can imagine two switches controlling two light, controlling two light bulbs. And so if we have these two bulbs always together, we can imagine that both are off one is off and the other one is on, or the other one on and the other one is off, and to both being on. Now it's important to distinguish, distinct, sorry, distinguish the state of when one bulb can be on and the other one being off, because if we have two bulbs, we could call them bulb one and bulb two, or we could say bulb one is off and bulb two is on, or bulb one is on and bulb two, of, bulb two is off. And now we have four distinct states. Note it that with two bits, we can represent four distinct states or values. And so what do you think happened if we had even more bits? Well, we could, you can imagine we're gonna be able to represent even more distinct states and more values. So we know now that grouping bits together or using more than one bit allows us to represent even more distinct states. And so we're gonna start grouping bits together and giving them names. But we also, just as before when we had two bulbs, we had to distinguish between bulb one and bulb two so too we'll have to do when we start grouping bits together. So what we want to do is think logically in our head that our bits, when they're in a group, are arranged left to right, and the leftmost bit, which we're going to call zero here, for illustration only, is going to be our most significant bit. And the uh, bit on the right side, the rightmost bit, we're going to call our least significant bit. So we have most significant bit on the left and least significant bit on the right. And we're going to think um, of writing from left to right in like the Western system. Now, there's some disagreement maybe you would want to say about how bits and bytes should be arranged in a computer. And when it's written from left to right, like imagine you wanted to write the number 1208. And if you're in the Western system, you write 1208. That we're going to call Big Indian, E-N-D-I-A-N. If you were to write it the other way, which you write, you know, um, 8021, that would be called Little Indian. So that would be the equivalent of writing not from left to right, but rather from right to left, as they do in some languages. And so that is Little Indian. Now, that's, this Indianness only come in when you have to do system program, like really low level programming, and you have to manipulate the bits. But it's just worth knowing that there's these two different ways of how bits are stored and bytes are stored. We'll get to bytes in a minute. Um, but just remember that there are two different ways whether you store them from left to right or right to left and they refer to whether um, the most significant bit or byte is on the left hand side versus on the right hand side. And so that's all we're gonna say about Indianness because for the most part it's gonna be hidden from us unless we're doing system programming. Okay, so I just mentioned the word byte in the previous uh, a few seconds ago, you might have even heard about bytes being mentioned a number of times, like, you know, my bandwidth is, you know, 20 megabits or 20 megabytes, or um, I have an R drive that is 20 gigabytes or something like that, or my memory is, you know, 80 gigs or 8, 90 gigs, 8 megs or something like that. Uh, if you have a server, you probably have, you know, 80 gigs of memory. But anyway, 
when we start grouping bits together, we want to give names to um, different collections of bits. So it's accepted to call four bits in nibble, even though you're never really going to be able to allocate that. But that's all you, if somebody said I have nibbles, four bits. Uh, if you have eight bits, that's a byte. Now, when you get to 16, 32 bits and 64 bits, it depends. Um, different programming language and depending on which operating system, uh, which processor you're using, um, would have um, different names for it. And so we will see what Go calls it, but there's no point in really trying to tell you here in this slide because we're going to talk about data types later. So we'll get into that. So just know that how um, their names given to them and it's going to vary by programming language. The important one is really to know that how a byte is 8 bits. Commit that to memory. That doesn't change at all. So a byte is 8 bits. Just remember that. So in the previous slide, we saw that how you can group bits into a certain quantity of bits and then give them name. So how do you interpret that information? So there's something called a binary number system. And basically, it specifies how you should read um, bits to turn them into numbers. And we'll see a little bit about it. We're not going to spend too much time on it because, again, this is more low-level things, but it's good to have some idea of what's going on. Now, let's assume that I had X number of bytes, uh, let's say four, X number of bits, sorry, four bits to represent um, some numbers. Now, if I'm going to do sign numbers, so if sign numbers mean that I'll have to differentiate between a negative number and a positive number, I'll need some way to say that oh, this is a negative number or a positive number. And in that case, we use the most significant bit as our sign bit. So if that bit is zero, we say, oh, the rest of the bit, the remaining bits, uh, represent the positive number. And if that first bit is one, we say the rest of the remaining bits are going to be used to represent the number. So here's an example. Let's say we had four bits that were being used, and we wanted to treat it as unsigned, which we didn't care about sign. Sign. Everything is just positive number. Then we're going to be able to use all those bits to just represent the number we want, and we'll see that in a slide just now. But if we're doing with sign numbers, then we have to reserve that first bit as our sign bit, and then we only have three bits to represent our number. As you can imagine, if we had three bits to represent number, we should we're going to be able to represent less numbers, positive numbers, than if we had all four all four bits to represent numbers. But we don't really lose anything because in one case we get to just say everything is positive, like from zero to seven, for example. But then if we do in sign, we'll get to represent you know zero and include in minus three to my um, to positive three. And so it depends on what is it that you want to represent that you can decide how you use those bits. And there are data types specific for that. And we're going to get back to that when we start talking about the data type and go in the next video. Now, imagine that oh, you wanted to keep track of how many apples are in a barrel. Now, since you know that oh, they're never going to be negative apples in a barrel, you can say that oh, all I want all my bits to be um, un unsigned because I don't ever have to deal with negatives. And that will allow you to represent more um, positive values than if you said I wanted a sign variable or value because um, it's going to be half as much even though you're never ever going to represent a negative number of apples in a barrel. So two things to note here. Um, when we talk about negative sign numbers, um, in the case of when you use one, zero, zero, remember that one represents negative and zero, zero, well, it's just zero. I mean, you can think negative zero, but zero is zero, negative or positive. It doesn't have a sign. Now, the other thing to look at is how minus 3 is represented. Minus 3 is represented as 1, of course, for the sign bit, and then 0, 1, saying the value. But how is that negative 3 when you look at the, for the sign case, um, 3 is represented with 1, 1? Well, it has to do with something called 2's complement, which is what the computer uses. It can use 1 complement too, but 2's complement is what they use. And if you want to learn more about that gory detail, feel free to jump into uh, Wikipedia are the link below the slide. So here's a quick slide on the kind of numbers we get to represent with a different number of bits. So I didn't put four down because, like I said, even though we have the concept of a nibble, you don't ever allocate anything as a nibble. So a byte is usually the smallest you can allocate. And so if you have a byte and it's unsigned, then you can represent numbers between 0 and 255. So that's, for example, you can use a byte value to represent somebody's age because as far as we know yet, nobody's going to live past 255. Um, but if you wanted to represent something that have a negative number and it doesn't go beyond 127, then 
um, a sign byte is what the appropriate type that you might want to use. You always kind of want to use a size appropriate to type of data that you're representing. So if you're using age, and since somebody age is going to be ever greater than 255, um, why use a value or more bits than you need, like 64 bits for example? As you can see, the range for 64 bits is huge. Not to mention you're actually kind of wasting space. But that is just an example of how you can choose the appropriate number of bits to represent the kind of numbers you want. So I started talking about everything inside a computer is a number, and then those numbers are built up by bits. I also said that you can group bits into different, like, among number of bits into categories we call, like, bytes, 16 bits, 32 bits, or 64 bits. But at the end of the day, what we really, really talk about is just bytes. So you can get four bytes and make 32 bits, but we really talk about when we're storing information, we talk about the capacity of our storage device, whether that's a USB drive or memory inside a computer or whatever. We talk of it in terms of bytes. And so we have bits, and then inside of being quantized in terms of bytes, and then we see our storage device has, you know, like one kilobyte storage or one megabytes or something. It's important to note that the one kilobyte is really not a thousand, but 1024. And that comes from the fact that we're doing in twos, um, um, a binary system that um, where we d deal in base twos. And so that's gonna make sense probably some other time, but we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it other than to say that um, this is how it is. It's 1024 bytes is actually one kilobit, not a thousand, and so on. Final concept here is the address of byte. Just like when we had bits in a byte, or we had groups of bits, we had to say, oh, this is bit zero, bit one, blah, 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 to be able to distinguish each bit. If we have multiple bytes, we have to be able to distinguish them too, because we have to be able to say, at byte at address location four, I want that byte address location four to be changed, or I want to read its value. Or I want to change all the bytes from zero to three, for example. And so that's called addressing. Now, um, you don't have to do too much with knowing what the address of something is, um, but because Go allows you to take the address of um, things, that's why it's worthwhile to mention it. But in other languages like Java and so on, you don't even think about it. But system languages like C, C++, and Go, you tend to uh, manipulate things by their address. And it has implication of how well you, how fast your program can run because if you can pass the address to something then you don't have to always pass the entire thing so one way of imagining this is if i had a thousand bytes in memory representing let's say a file for example or a string that i've written hello world da, 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 da. the world is coming to an end but it's an awesome place anyway and that started from address location zero all the way out to 1023 now if i had to pass that to another function I can actually say, here, send these 1,024 um, bytes, or I can say, here, at address zero, read 1,024 a, a bytes. And that's much faster, because I sent the address, which is just one number, and in zero, or however many bits I need to represent the address, and I just say how many bytes to read from that location. So don't worry about it. I'll say it over and over and demonstrate it, and it's kind of going to make sense. So earlier in this video, I said everything that you type into a computer is a number. And then I said that numbers are made up of bits. So let's try and compare something that you might be very familiar with. Let's think about how you store one way of storing information. Of course, you can use a picture, but let's think about in literature sense. If you want to store some information and convey it, you'd write it down, let's say, in book, a book. And so books are made up of, if you take a book, it's going to be made up of chapters. And what are inside of chapters? Well, chapters are you know, have sections, and then inside each section of a chapter are paragraphs, and then a paragraph is made up of a sentence. And what is a sentence made up of? Words, right? And then if you look at a word, what is it? It's just characters, right? You know, alphanumeric characters and symbols. And so that what a character is, is just some letter, number, or a symbol. Now let's go over to the computer side of things, because it actually compares very well. We have pretty much the same thing. So a program is sort of like a book, right? One program is like one book, contains everything you need to have there in that program. And then how do we break up programs? Well, very large complex program, we break them up into packages. Now, that would be just like a chapter. Now, what's a section then a correspond to in a computer program? Well, actually, that's just a sub package, right? Or a sub module. And you could see that here on this slide, um, the Google um, Lib standard packages also have sub packages.
right? So it's not such a far-fetched idea. A function is like a paragraph. It, not may, it may not be reusable, like paragraphs are not reusable in a book, but as, like fun as functions are in a program. But think about it, a paragraph convey one idea. There's an introductory sentence, the details of that um, to support to support that state first open uh, the introduction to the paragraph and then closing. So a function is pretty much the same way, right? It deals with like one thing and one thing only. And what is a function made up of? Statements, one or more statements, right? And those statements have tokens, right? Uh, what we call tokens. It's almost like words. And those tokens are, again, just characters. Like, remember what I said? Everything you type into the computer is a character. Everything you type. And you can type letters, numbers, or symbols, but they are just characters. And then we said that that is really can be broken down to just a number of bits. So everything, your entire program, is just a set of bits. Just like if you take a book, everything in there is just a character, either a letter, a number, or a symbol. All the formatting and everything to show you where character um, paragraphs and chapter starts and chapter heading, if you take all that away, all you have is one long stream of characters. And the exact same thing in a program, except if you go a little bit lower in the computer, you have bits because you have to cross this boundary from where human, human beings type characters to where the computer understands bits and represent them as bits and manipulate them as bits. Okay, we're finally ready to wrap this all up now. So let's take this ASCII table. And ASCII is a specification for how to use numbers to represent those characters that I say, which is letter numbers and symbols. So in this table, up at the top, you're going to see some numbers at the very, very top row. There's like three bits um, numbers. And then to the left are the four bits numbers. I'm going to say it's eight bits, but really, as you can see, it's just seven being represented here. So if I wanted to type the number or the character four into the computer, that gets represented by the bit 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. So first you read the top one and then the one um, to the left. And if I wanted to type the character V, well, that gets represented by 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. So that's just seven bits. But remember, the smallest number of bits you can allocate in a computer is eight bits, which is a byte. So those seven bits are going to be fitted into a byte. It's just that the first bit is going to be unused or ignored for all intents and purposes. And so as you can see from this little table, all the, well, a lot of symbols and characters and numbers are there. No, this is not enough to represent your favorite language. So if you speak Hindi or you write Arabic or Chinese or something, you can see that's sorely missing from there. There are thousands of Chinese characters, for example, and using eight bits is simply not enough to represent like the Chinese characters. So for that reason, there's another standard called UTF-8, and you can go check it out at um, Wikipedia. And basically, it can use more than eight bits to represent those other um, languages and characters from those other languages. But again, it comes back to this. It is just bits that being used to represent numbers and all the computer deal with are numbers and bits. That's it. Now, I hope you've learned something. I know that uh, this seems like probably a little bit far-fetched from the language, but I hope I've really brought it back home and show you something kind of fundamental. And it's gonna hopefully in the end make you a little bit more comfortable using this language Go. Again, it's not required for a lot of um, programming and most people will teach you programming without ever touching bits. I think that's a mistake. Anyway, with all that preaching as aside, I hope you learned something new. I hope you appreciate it. And again, if you haven't subscribed, please do spread the word and I'll see you in the next video. Take care and thanks for your time. Bye.